Hello, everyone. I'm Ashim Singh. I'm Director of Economics here at the RSA. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the latest event in our Bridges to the Future series, where we're exploring ideas to shape change in the post-COVID world, whenever the heck we actually get to that point. Today, I am delighted to be joined by Sir Ronald Cohen, Chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, Chairman of the Portland Trust, author, raconteur, uh, pioneering philanthropist, venture capitalist, private equity investor and social innovator for nearly two decades. His initiatives have catalyzed a global movement, I think it's fair to call it, to drive private capital to serve social and environmental good. And we're going to get right into that over the course of this talk. He's joined us today to discuss a new book he's written. It's called Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. Here it is, very handsome it is too. Uh, it's, I would refer to it as a sort of whistle-stop tour of more than a decade of global development catalyzed by, well, many of his own initiatives in the global impact investment market. Purest note, Sir Ronald has very graciously encouraged me to call him Ronnie, which, Ronnie, I will be taking you up on that. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you also. It is a real privilege to be here with you, especially, if I may say, as um, I also wrote a book uh, along these lines a couple of years back called The Moral Marketplace. We covered some of the same ground, but interestingly, I think it's fair to say, I was maybe a hair more skeptical about some of the areas then perhaps it comes over in your very fine text. And over the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to get into some of these arguments, surface what the book is saying, but also a few of these points of difference as well, and really, really get into the meat of some of these huge issues. Let's get into it. Uh, Ronnie, you acknowledge in the forward to the book that it emerges in a world transformed by the pandemic, something you couldn't possibly have foreseen when you started out to write it. You did. Our economy is a mess. The V-shaped Recovery that we were promised by the Panglossians in the Commentariat is a sham. Inequality seems destined to grow. The world is aflame with cries of racial and gender injustice. Into this veil of tears strides the impact revolution. What is it? Why is it so important? How can it possibly help us at this, our darkest hour? Ashim, it's very nice to be here with you and uh, with all the members of uh, the RSA uh, to talk about uh, impact, uh, both uh, the book and, uh, and uh, the movement. Uh, there are echoes of 1929 in the air, Ashim. In 1929, after the great crash, investors sat up and said, um, have we really been investing in companies without measuring properly the profit they make. And of course, it led to generally accepted accounting principles four years uh, later when legislation was, uh, was passed in the United States, which was then followed across the world and to the use of independent auditors. And I think today, investors who are channeling more than $30 trillion to environmental, social, and governance uh, investments, uh, and uh, more than $700 billion into impact investment, where the impact is measured, unlike uh, ESG. Uh, impact investment, as you well know, has not only the intention to create uh, impact, but also uh, the measurement uh, of it. Um, so with more than $30 trillion, about a third of professionally managed assets in the world going to companies, investors are sitting up and saying this time, are we only investing in companies on the basis of the profit they make with no transparency on the impact companies are creating? And so I believe that COVID-19 will accelerate now a move to transparency on the impact that our whole economic system creates, which is, of course, comprised primarily of companies and of, of investors. And so, as we are going to see governments emerge from this crisis with higher level of debt uh, than we have uh, seen in, in decades, uh, perhaps uh, since uh, the Great Depression, and the similarly high levels of unemployment, um, we're going to need to bring impact investment uh, and companies um, to provide solutions to the great social and environmental challenges we face. So I see COVID-19 as an accelerator of this transition to impact economies. 
Yeah, so that's really interesting. So for you, impact is a very practical thing. It makes sense, of course. It's not just an idea. It's not, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, does it really make an impact? It's, it's not a philosophical idea or approach. It's actually a series of practices that cut across all institutions in society and that can transform or make a difference to all of them. Is that the argument here? Yes, indeed. I think what's been happening in the world over the last uh, couple of uh, decades is an evolution in thinking and a revolution in the means we use to tackle social and environmental issues. Yeah. The revolution in thinking has been around the notion uh, that uh, we can't just worry about profit uh, and not worry about the huge damage environmental and social uh, that companies are creating and then rely on our governments to tax us all in order to try to remedy them. The system is self-defeating and we have to change it. And I think COVID has heightened the sense of disquiet uh, and increased the questioning of capitalism. So that's the evolution in thinking. The revolution in means comes from realizing that consumer preferences and talent preferences in terms of employment and investor preferences have been shifting away from making decisions on the basis of risk and return alone to making decisions on the basis of risk, return and impact. And if we measure impact in a similar way that we measure profit and, and risk, which is we are perfectly capable of doing uh, today, uh, and uh, I can give you a database where all our viewers uh, can go to look at information on uh, the impacts of companies. Uh, if we're going uh, to bring impact to the center of our economic uh, system, uh, then we have to measure it uh, in a similar way to profit and, and risk. And since we can do this now, the revolution in means is that by optimizing risk, return, and impact, we bring all of our investment and all of our companies to create solutions to the challenges we face instead of creating problems. I mean, there is so much in what you've just said. I mean, it's an incredibly rich answer. And what I'll try and do is I'll try and unpick bits of that and different questions as we go. I mean, Let's start with the first thing that you said, which is really interesting, which is about the way that we solve social problems, the way that we marshal society's resources to deal with endemic social issues. And you, begin, you begin the book, actually, uh, with a story that I think RSA fellows who work in the charity sector, who work in social enterprise, um, who work in government even, will be familiar, or at least incidentally at the margins. And that's the story of the social impact bond, a certain kind of impact investment instrument that it seems for you it exemplifies, it's a touchstone of this revolution of means, of practice, of impact and of efficiency that you're talking about. Um, it's, it's otherwise, you know, it's, it's known variously as a social impact bond, a payment on success bond, I think in other places. In the development space, it's known as a development impact bond with some variations. You're a champion of it. Uh, for you, it's ground zero, the Archimedean point of the wave of innovation of the last decade. Can you explain, first of all, before we get into some analysis of that, just what exactly an SIB is and why they're as important as you argue they are. Absolutely. Uh, the purpose of the social impact bond is to provide investment uh, initially to non-profits, but today more widely to non-profits and purpose-driven businesses in addressing social issues and environmental issues uh, uh, as well. For the first time, this uh, way of investing links the return of capital and the financial return on investment to the achievement of a social or environmental goal. And uh, the first bond, the Peterborough bond, uh, sought to reduce the number of young people who go back to jail after their release. As you, as you know, Ashim, uh, more than 60% go back to jail within 18 months of, of release. And the first bond involved raising five million pounds uh, to fund nonprofits working with these prisoners. 
And because we achieved the reduction of 9.5% in the number going back over a period of, of five years, uh, the Ministry of Justice in the UK repaid the £5 million and an annual return of 3.1%. Um, to uh, the foundations uh, that had put uh, the money up. Now, it's broadened to be a much broader uh, uh, tool uh, than we'd initially envisaged. As you were saying, it's being used in emerging uh, markets in the form of development impact bonds. There are a couple of hundred uh, social and development impact bonds across the world. Uh, they involve... Um, outcome payments uh, of uh, a, 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 you know, a billion uh, dollars uh, or more investment of about half uh, of that. They tackle 15 different um, social issues across 30 countries. But what is really significant about the social impact bond, as you were suggesting, and which I, I do see in the book as really the, the start of this whole impact uh, uh, economy uh, effort, if you like, is that they optimize not just risk and return, but risk, return, and impact. And actually, the social impact bond and all forms of impact investment, uh, which uh, involve traditional asset classes like venture capital, private equity, investment in public stocks, investment in bonds, where there is measurement of, of impact, all of those forms of investment optimize risk, return, and impact, which the social impact bond did for the first time. Fascinating. And you, you refer to this in the book as a sort of new frontier of efficiency when it comes to tackling social problems, which is a wonderful, exhilarating image. I remember when I first, as a, as a lowly researcher in 2008, when I first came across the, uh, the, the plans for the social impact bond that your team at Social Finance put together, Toby Eccles, Emily Bolton. Uh, I, I, I remember taking this to my boss at the time and saying, we, 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 we've got to get into this. This is really interesting. We've got to understand this a bit better. Over the years, I've, I've come to understand it a bit better. And just for the, for the sake of our viewers, I want to really spell out what's going on here. So you've got investors investing and providing upfront capital. And Peter, it wasn't the private sector, but it was a pilot, so that makes sense. You've got government paying from public funds. You've got the charities delivering. There's a delivery group. There's also a control group, isn't there? So you can see whether the delivery group is doing, is doing a better job than, than, than if the intervention hadn't happened at all in terms of reducing reoffending and therefore the cost on the state. You've got a bunch of smart people working out how much everyone gets in the event of a successful outcome, but also what a successful outcome looks like, and it's of sort of quantifying and measuring that and putting all the data together to do that. And then for every success, an investor will receive a quantum of public funds by way of return for the initial investment they put in. That's the basic idea, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, today we're finding philanthropists stepping in alongside governments and aid organizations stepping in alongside governments and a huge increase in scale. So the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, which I chair, is uh, catalyzing a billion dollar outcomes fund, uh, which will collect contributions from uh, aid organizations like uh, DFID, um, from uh, philanthropists and from uh, local governments to improve the education of 10 million children in uh, Africa and the Middle East. And so, so I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's a tool which has gone through its uh, sort of uh, proof of concept uh, and which is now ready for scaling. It's, it, these numbers are exhilarating and, and fast, and, and your book is filled with these fantastic examples of this large scale impact being driven by these instruments. But I suppose there's a challenge in this, isn't there? Because People may well ask, for all of this complication, and it is a complicated seeming instrument, yeah. um, can't better outcomes or these, just these outcomes be achieved by simply taxing more and using the extra funds you receive to deliver more or better services? Why are we taking money out of tax and putting it into the hands of private investors? 
The reason is that if you use entrepreneurship and open the door to innovation, which is not the government's forte, uh, you begin to develop uh, very, very powerful solutions. And I remember in the days of uh, venture capital, when I got into the nascent field, I was 26 uh, years old. I remember I was people much saying, the pub when I was 26, so I, th I think you were a bit more conscientious than I was. Okay, well, I was also in the pub, but uh, <laughs> the, the um, uh, whole uh, concept of venture capital led people to say similar things. It's so much more complicated to have an investment agreement with a company uh, which is uh, unquoted and so it doesn't give you the ability to sell your stake uh, and backing young people who haven't really proven uh, themselves um, it's so much easier just to buy a share uh, on the stock market. Yeah, but it's not the same thing. You're comparing apples and oranges. Venture capital brought us the tech revolution. The stock market wouldn't have brought that. Okay? It, it was a combination of expertise and patient capital and uh, people who are expert at uh, looking at uh, products and markets and management and competition and growth trends. Similarly, with impact investment and social impact bonds is one aspect of it. Of course, it involves effort to measure impact if you're not going to just invest on the basis of risk and return. But our system is going to improve many more lives and improve our planet instead of digging ourselves into a deeper and deeper hole as we're doing, as we're doing now. The complications, as happened with venture capital, and venture capital and private equity is today a $7 trillion pool, or at least 5 to $7 trillion pool, is you standardize. You standardize the agreements around social impact bonds. You create big outcomes funds. So you don't have to go around looking for outcome funding for every bond. You know where you can go. The investors don't have to be uh, uh, found every time you go to a social impact bond or a development impact bond fund. And so you begin to reduce the time, reduce the complexity and increase the scale. We'll come back to measurement, the question of whose measurements and what are we measuring presently. I think it's a really interesting, practical and philosophical point. But just one final thing about Peterborough, you refer to it as a success. You say the concept has been proven uh, government tried it, uh, everyone uh, did well, everyone who wanted, who needed to make money, the foundations, they made money. These are all good outcomes, it seems to me, based on what we're trying to achieve there. And yet, government hasn't followed up, they're not doing it anymore. So what, what happened there? Is it that your analysis is flawed, or is it that government are flawed and they've completely dropped the ball here? Well, the answer is Brexit for the UK. <laughs> uh, when, uh, when Ian Duncan Smith and uh, David Cameron uh, left office who were great uh, proponents of this. Uh, governments uh, after that were preoccupied with Brexit. Uh, uh, now it's interesting, central government hasn't pushed, but local government has. And there are now 60 social impact bonds in, in uh, the UK, about a third of the world uh, total, and another 60 in the pipeline. We have two social impact bond funds managed by Bridges uh, Ventures. And so I hope that government now with COVID uh, creating such uh, uh, huge challenges uh, for our economic uh, recovery, uh, that government will grasp with both hands uh, the opportunity created by outcomes funds. We should have billions of dollars going into outcomes funds to reskill the unemployed. The unemployed, many of them, will not find the old jobs they had. We have to face the fact they're going to be employed by smaller companies, more entrepreneurial companies, rather than big companies, because big companies coming out of this crisis have learned to operate on a slimmed down basis, and they're going to try and hold on to these productivity gains. So we're going to have a major challenge of reskilling uh, people for new jobs in new companies. Now, government should grasp this with both hands. Look at uh, what we've done 
uh, in, uh, in the UK with the apprenticeship scheme. We've raised billions of pounds, which has not been expended. Let's put those billions into an outcomes fund that pays for those who can successfully train apprentices and get them into jobs. Interesting. Um, and I suppose a further question, but this would, again, this, this speaks to the management, uh, the measurement, sorry, issue is job, there's jobs and there's good jobs, isn't there? And can an instrument like a social impact bond filter for you know, be, be sensitive enough to filter for say getting people into good jobs long-term jobs jobs that are good for their mental health rather than simply getting them into jobs or, or or will such funds always because of exigencies the difficulties of measurement find some kind of compromise position that is on one level on an individual individualistic level somewhat harmful so Ashim, you raise a very important point the great thing about impact bonds is their flexibility uh, you can have a five-year bond, and if it doesn't work out, unlike a government program which would continue for another 15 years, uh, it comes to an end. Uh, at the end of five years, if you want to launch another bond, you've learned about the metrics that need to be set so that you channel the effort to the population you want to, um, to help. And so you redesign uh, the metrics for the second bond. So... It is a very flexible instrument. And the key, about, the key thing about it, and it applies to philanthropists as well as, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as governments, the key thing about it is we're not spending money prescribing to those who are going to help vulnerable populations, be they not-for-profits or purpose-driven businesses, you're going to have to do the following. You're going to visit every prisoner uh, three times a month or four times a month or whatever it is. We're giving money to these organizations and saying your goal is to reduce the number of prisoners going back to jail by more than 7.5% over a period of time. If you achieve that, you get your money back and you get a return that increases with your success. So the delivery organizations become like businesses, even if they're non-profits. They have investment capital. They can define what innovation they want to use to achieve their targets, what other ways they want to, to achieve to, to help a great number of people. And at the end of the day, they know that if they deliver a return to their investors, which is sufficiently attractive, they'll be able to raise twice as much money. And so you give the key to the capital markets, to non-profits, and to social entrepreneurs leading purpose-driven businesses as well. That's a fantastic segue um, because it leads me directly into my next line of questioning, which is around impact investment, one of the pillars of the impact revolution, as you outline it in the book. Um, we both describe, I think, impact investment in the same way. Uh, you have ethical and responsible investment, which is about doing no harm. You have impact investment, which is about not doing no harm, but actually doing good. So an ethical or responsible investment might screen out for um, for tobacco or for arms, they might say, I'm not investing in these things, I don't agree with them. Whereas an impact investment, it's about actually investing in hospitals, in schools, in cancer treatments, in reducing recidivism, as was the social uh, impact bond in Peterborough. So, you know, I suppose the obvious response to all that is, it sounds great, um, it's a growing market, uh, it was referred to by JP Morgan as an asset class. I think that's possibly um, overstating it. It's a series of different approaches that, that is moving in some direction. But I suppose what I got from your book is that you see impact investment as augering a, a sort of greater holistic revolution. T -t -t Tell us about that. Yeah. So I, I see impact investment as the path to impact economies. Because we learn to optimize risk, return, and impact, and to deliver returns which are at least as good, in my view, as market rates of returns, at least as good. Because when we invest with impact as a dimension of our decision-making, we reduce the risk of consumers walking away from the products uh, of, of the companies we invest in, 
the risk of um, talent walking away from them, of investors shifting away from them as they've done from fossil fuel companies and, uh, uh, you know, and so on to clean energy, and also the risk of regulation and taxation coming. Uh, because the governments inevitably are going to have to minimize the harm that companies, that companies do. So you improve the risk side of your equation. But you also improve the opportunity side. I just want to give you an example of what I, I mean to bring this uh, home. Uh, because it will illustrate what an impact economy can do. Uh, there's a company called Orcam in Israel. Uh, which wanted to help the blind. Uh, the aunt of one of the founders was going blind. The founder was a very sophisticated entrepreneur and AI, uh, artificial intelligence uh, expert. Uh, he sold out his uh, first company, which he co-founded, for $15 billion to Intel in, in the area of driverless cars. And Orcam has developed a pair of spectacles for the blind, spectacles like those you and I are, are wearing, with a little memory stick-like device hanging from the side, which whispers into the ear of the wearer the page of the book they're reading, or the newspaper, or the banknote in their hands. And you and I, and everyone else viewing us today, would say this is a fantastic impact venture. It can help 35 million blind people in the world and 250 million visually impaired people, okay? And the company indeed has been very successful. It raised $100 million of capital. The last round was at $600 million. Now, if you view things with an impact lens, you ask yourself the question, how can my technology help the maximum number of people? And then the answer is a surprising one. Uh, the answer is, what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world? What would that do for their lives and their livelihoods? What would it do for their economies? And what would it do for the world economy to bring 800 million people from illiteracy to being able to read? And so I'm a firm believer, and I speak as a seasoned investor, that optimizing risk, return, and impact will open up new sets of growth and profit opportunities at the same time. Now, if you imagine this is at the center of our economic system, Ashim, if you imagine that companies have been required by governments, which governments should do today, to publish impact-weighted financial accounts where any investor, any employee, any consumer can find both the impact and the profit performance of, of a company, then you begin to use our economic system to bring solutions rather than to create problems which we then have to try to remedy. And an initiative I chair at Harvard Business School published just a few days ago, the environmental cost of 50 of 1800 companies, 1800 companies broken down by each area of environmental impact. And next year, we will add to that the employment impact of companies, as well as their product impact. And we will be able to measure the total impact of a company. Now, what numbers emerge from that? Take three chemical companies. Sasol in South Africa has $12 billion of sales and creates $17 billion of environmental damage a year. Solve in Europe has similar sales, $12 billion, and creates $3.7 billion of environmental damage. And BASF, also based in, in, in Europe, has $70 billion of sales and creates $7 billion of environmental damage. So one creates 10% of its sales in damage, the other 29%, and the last one, 139% damage. Now, isn't that 
a set of figures that all of us should know. Shouldn't we create a race to the top? And when we think in terms of social problems, when we think in terms of social diversity, take Intel, for example. Here's a company that has been driving for uh, diversity and well-being in its workforce. It pays $7 billion a year to its 50,000 US employees. And superficially, we would all say that's a fantastic social impact. But if you look at the local demographics surrounding their facilities and compare it with their employment, you realize that there is a huge social cost that Intel is, is causing. If you add to the missing number of people from minority groups all the way up its organization, the salary levels that they would have earned, and if you account for other uh, negative employment impact, Intel's positive employment impact falls from seven billion to just two and a half billion, and that's probably the best in the tech world. Now, shouldn't we be sharing these numbers across all tech firms for all of us to see? And if we do so, isn't the result going to be that consumers and talent and investors will go to those who do a better job of delivering impact as well as profit? I, th I think that, um, I mean, impact-weighted accounts are, seems to me when I was reading the book, that was the big idea, it seemed to me, that emerged from it towards the end. And I have to say, I... I find myself saying yes a lot in response to some of those rhetorical questions that you put our way. I think it's a really interesting idea and it's information that I think would really enrich the public space. Um, and I suppose in that spirit though, there are a couple of challenges, one direct one perhaps, and one broader challenge that I'd just like to put to you and get your response to um, as, as, we, as we move into the final section of our time together, which has just flown by, frankly. Um, the first thing, the first very direct challenge is, you talk a lot in the book, in our conversation today, about measurement, measuring things, measuring good things, measuring change. One of the things that we know uh, from, certainly from the last few uh, weeks and months, whether it's questions of racial justice when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's gender justice and then the Me Too movement, often the question of measurement isn't, isn't simply an objective thing. It's about who's doing the measuring, where does the power come from, and who ultimately has to say in the construction of the system that you're using to define what good looks like. Isn't the danger with, not just with impact, I think, I think the danger is less with impact weighted, weighted accounts actually, because that seems to be quite a, that seems to be quite a good sort of idea to attach to business bottom lines more generally. But generally speaking with the impact movement, isn't there a danger here that we're simply instantiating and internalizing privilege by reflecting an existing view of what good or good change or social change looks like that doesn't speak to a diversity of perspectives and voices? So I think the rules of our system create the norms and values as well as reflect them. In uh, 1929, and I said there were echoes of 1929 in the air, every company picked its own uh, financial accounting policies and there were no auditors to verify the numbers and each company could squirrel away profit without explaining to investors how much or why. Seems ridiculous. <laughs> it seems ridiculous today. And yet, when the idea that you should have a standard set of accounting principles for all companies so you can make comparisons and somebody should be looking at the numbers and say these numbers are true, there were remonstrations in, in, in uh, Parliament, uh, excuse me, in Congress, um, that uh, this would spell the end of American capitalism. Okay? Now, when we changed the rules and went to generally accepted accounting principles, which gave an objective view of what the real profit of a company is, and when we had auditors verify that, we increased confidence in our system 
And we began to impose certain norms of behavior which companies had to follow, okay? And so the integrity of companies became extremely important and we could all measure it, right? Uh, if, a, if a company uh, had uh, published false uh, uh, information, uh, the people who did it went to jail. The same has to become true of impact now. We're in the same situation we were in for profit in 29 with impact today. 30 trillion is going in and companies are reporting about the wonderful things they're doing in the area of impact without talking about the bad things they're doing and without giving us any numbers about the value of, of either the good or the bad. Now we can create impact accounting principles today and they should be audited and they will change the norms of our behavior in the sense that for a company just to make money will become unacceptable. A company that is polluting and creating social issues will show a much lower impact weighted profit than a company that is as profitable but improving the environmental and the social uh, you know, uh, dimensions of our, you know, of, of, of our lives. And so we will begin to create norms about creating uh, impact as well as profit. That should be the norm for our society uh, today. I mean, I, I think that's really interesting. And I think it speaks that there's a broader question here, isn't there? I mentioned earlier, and perhaps as one final bit of mischief that I want to sling your way, perhaps I can, uh, perhaps I can uh, refer to a conversation I had on, on this stage, well, not on this stage, this is my parents' front room, but on the RSA stage when we were doing an equivalent series of talks last year with a, a man named Anand Kirdurdas, who's a presenter in CNBC on Vice TV. He wrote a quite cool little book called Winners Take All, He's not an economist, he's not a philosopher, he's a journalist, but I would categorize, as a philosopher, I'd categorize his approach as Aristotelian in nature. So he asks quite simply, on a personal level, are impact investors from financial backgrounds the right people we want handling our improvement of the world? Think of the crash, do we really want to give the keys to the fire truck to the arsonist who started the fire. And then, then there's a broader institutional critique, which is sort of, do we want to shift political decisions in society about what's improved and what isn't from elected democratic politicians, bureaucrats unelected, but they serve politicians, to unelected uh, philanthropists, investors, and so on. It's an important challenge, isn't it? Um, it's a massive, potentially a massive movement of power within society. How do you respond as a kind of final response to my challenges? How do you respond to those two quite distinct but interrelated problems? So dealing with the, with the first, the lifeblood of our economic system is investment. Okay, capitalism is about capital. We don't want to give up the power of capitalism to create growth and improve the standards of living in the way that it has done and take uh, people out of poverty in the way that capitalism has done. What's happening today is that the consequences of the capitalist system are just too great even for our governments to cope with environmentally and socially. And so we have to change its self-defeating nature by balancing risk which we began to measure in the middle of the last uh, century, return which we've measured for, you know, for, for, for some uh, centuries, and now impact. We have to bring those three to the center of our decision making. Now, will wealthy people who make investments drive the creation of impact? Yes, they will within that, within that system. Now, if you look at um, the wealthy today, uh, many of them come from nothing like me. Uh, I was a refugee. I came to Britain at the age of 11. I was lucky to be helped. Uh, I went to a state school. My education was paid for at Oxford. I got a scholarship to Harvard Business School. Okay. Uh, 
I'm wealthy today. I'm wealthy because I was lucky enough to get that education. And then it allowed me to take advantage of a new industry, venture capital and, and venture capital and, um, and then private equity. And for me, there were ways of doing something useful, of creating jobs at a time when there were 3 million unemployed in, in, in the UK. Now, you can either view me as a wealthy person who's trying to perpetuate the existing system, which is what you know, he would say, uh, or you can view me as a refugee who, because he has been helped, wants to help others. Okay, I leave you to judge on the basis of my book, Impact, which of the two categories I, I fit in. Now let's come to your second very important question. The rules of the game have to be objectively observed. Uh, an impact accounting system has to give an objective view of the impact created, just as our financial system gives an accurate view of, uh, of the profit that is created. If government then wants to provide incentives to companies creating impact in the area of diversity, positive impact, or in the environmental area, or in recruiting the unemployed, government can provide tax incentives for that. You know, perhaps where the world will be some years from now is that the tax rate of companies that deliver greater impact will be lower than the tax rate of, uh, of companies that uh, deliver negative impact, you know? But that is the role of government, not the role of the accounting system. So the accounting system helps to provide the information to reshape our norms. And I think the wealthy who are versed in the investment world and who have significant resources today. And we've seen far too much uh, money go to the wealthy relative to other uh, people in, in society. For 25 years, salaries for most people have stagnated. And uh, because uh, of technology and because of uh, the importance of the growing importance of finance, those who've been lucky enough to be involved in these two fields have been able to make gargantuan amounts of, of money. We have to use that money. We have to use their philanthropy. We have to use their investment. They're open-minded. Most of them came from nothing. They didn't come from wealthy families. We're, uh, we're not talking of inherited wealth. If you look today at the biggest fortunes out of, of tech, if you look at uh, uh, Bill Gates or, 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 or Bezos or you know, anyone else that you, you know, or Zuckerberg, right? these are not people who inherited wealth. They're people who came from nothing and can empathize uh, with those who come from nothing. And they can contribute hugely to the improvement of our society and our planet. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll... You, this sort of, I mean, it was, this was trendily sort of called philanthropic capitalism, wasn't it? Uh, a few years back, the, the question of the role of, of the rich and even the super rich in, uh, in improving our world. It's definitely uh, an incredibly vociferous issue. There are so many who take your view. And I, you know, when you were responding to that question, you were saying, well, do you think I'm a, do you think I'm one of the good guys or the bad guys? I, I very much see the work you've done over the last 10 years as incredibly inspiring someone like myself. So, but I can also see the perspectives of, of people who are wary of privilege and also objectively aware that we you know, you talk about COVID and, and circling us back to the beginning, when Bill Gates was talking about vaccinations, there were so many conspiracy theories that emerged about him. And you know, people online, you know, the populist movement against the philanthropic capitalist trend, if you like, that was sort of saying, well, you know, uh, we don't want this guy. I'll, I'll never get a vaccination if it's something that's been produced by a Bill Gates lab, all the rest of it. Some really crazy stuff out there. But I suppose my final question, my final bit of mischief, and you've been very patient with my various little challenges, so thank you, is do you fear that all of these very reasonable things that you're saying, these reasonable cases that you're making, might be lost in the more, the fog of the current media environment that is populist, there's a backlash against 
the rich, there's a backlash against these fortunes. Do, do you fear this agenda might be lost in that? And how do we mitigate against that? So I think we're at a crossroad. Again, 1929 is in the air, where we can either go the populist route, which creates uh, great divisions in our society, uh, or we can go the direction of uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal and try to open a new chapter in our development uh, as a society. Some will go some, you know, one way and some will go the other. I'm hoping that the majority of uh, democratic countries will go in the direction of the New Deal. The most important step in providing that New Deal is to ensure that companies are transparent about their impact so that they have a major incentive to improve it and to bring solutions to us. So I am fearful uh, that uh, too many countries will go the populist route. And the way to avoid that, as we did in, in 29, to preserve our, uh, our, our system and improve it and improve lives as a result of it. And there's been huge economic progress since 1929 uh, for the majority of, uh, uh, of people. But we have to recognize that the system we have today, the economic system we have, does not distribute outcomes fairly. It just does not do that. And if we want to have a fair and sustainable recovery from COVID-19 and have a better system that improves lives, spreads equality of opportunity better, enables people to improve their lives better, and measures the harm that, uh, and the good that uh, people do uh, as they run companies and work in companies, as well as the profit they make, then we have to be bold as we were, or the US was in 1933. We have to mandate that the era of impact has now uh, come and that companies have to be transparent, not just about their financial performance, but about their impact performance as well. And in this way, we will use our economic system to improve lives and our planet instead of constantly creating harm that governments tax us all in unsuccessful efforts to remedy the harm that's been done. The era of impact has come. Quote, uh, Ronnie Cohen, um, I can't believe it. We've covered so much in that session. We've covered the New Deal, 1929, impact-weighted accounts, how to do charitable action better, philanthropy, investment, millions of people helped with AI uh, and, and, and other technologies. It's been a fascinating conversation, but we have run out of time, I'm afraid. All that's left for me to say is thanks again for talking to me today, Ronnie. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, joining us. I know that RSA fellows will be really grateful and hopefully inspired by some of the things that you've been talking about and that we've debated today. If you've been watching along today, and bless you, if you have, do head over to the RSA website now for more information on Impact Revolution and links to Impact. Here it is again in the book, very handsome volume, as I said earlier. Tweet me at Robin Asheen. Tell me I've been talking nonsense. Or I think you're on Twitter as well, aren't you, Ronnie? Yep, I am indeed. Please go to Twitter. Yeah, and, and tell, tell Ronnie, oh, you know, I didn't like what that Asheen thing was saying to you. Um, and, or, or generally join in the debate there. And of course, on the RSA website, there's lots of information on our work on inclusive economies and economic resilience post-COVID, a fair deal for key workers, the future of the firm, and indeed what tomorrow's uh, company and business environment looks like. I think impact-weighted accounts are going to be part of that future. I just have a hunch. Uh, social impact bonds are here. Maybe impact-weighted accounts are going to go the same way. And there's also, of course, all the news from our 30,000 fellows all over the world, just to say we'd love to hear your ideas on what's needed to tackle economic insecurity, on what's been, what we've been talking about today, and to create a more just, resilient, post-pandemic future. So do get involved in the conversation on the hashtag, hashtag RSA Bridges. And finally, thank you once again to Ronnie, Sir Ronald Cohen, for joining us. And thank you all for watching. Thank you, Ashley.